Welcome to the Superstar Communicator Podcast. My name is Susan Heaton Wright, a leading impact speaking and communications expert. My aim is to show you how to make an impact so you will be heard, listened to, and respected for career success. Listen weekly to the podcast and go to our website, superstarcommunicator.com. Hello, everybody. I am so excited, and I know that a number of listeners have been looking forward to this. I have got on the other end of the internet, Joe McCormack. He's back. We, it, we had an interview last year about his amazing book, Brief. And I know that there are a number of you listeners who have bought the book and are using the principles behind, his, um, behind the book to have concise, clear speaking and communication with other people. He has recently brought out a new book and he was very, very kind to send this to me. And it is called Noise, Noise, not Noise, Noise. Um, he is passionate about helping people gain clarity when there's so much noise competing for our attention. He's a successful marketer, entrepreneur and author. And his first book, Brief, Make a Bigger Impact by Saying Less, sets the standard for concise communication. He's the founder and managing director of The Brief Lab, an organization dedicated to teaching professionals, military leaders, and entrepreneurs how to think and communicate clearly. His clients include Boeing, Harley Davidson, Microsoft, MasterCard, DuPort, and um, select military units and government agencies. So welcome, Joe. I'm so Wonderful excited. to talk to you again. Wonderful to talk to you again. I'm so excited about this. Well, first of all, thank you very much for sending me this book in case you're looking on the, the internet. This book here that you sent me just after Christmas. I was so grateful and it has been an amazing read. Congratulations. Thank you so, thank you so much. No, it was, I was inspired to write it. It was not something that I was planning on doing. But after Brief came out five years or so, um, the, the publisher reached out to me and, they, and the publisher had asked, when is your next book? And I wasn't even thinking about writing another book. I, I wasn't really thinking about writing the first one. It was just happened through a series of circumstances. And then I started thinking about it a year and a half ago about information overload and, and just the excess of information that people are consuming on a day-to-day -day basis. And that led me to write a book about how to manage that. And then even the title itself was somewhat like, fortuitous, an accident, um, but, but it is noise and it's something that it's a reality that people have to deal with every day and I deal with it and it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's a burden, it's, di it's difficult. Now obviously you work with leaders and emerging leaders, how has this book helped? It really gives a name to a problem or a reality that people face every day, which is from the time that they wake up in the morning, throughout the entire day to the end, they're really in the business of just consuming information. It's like people describe it as drinking from a fire hose, being overwhelmed. Um, it's, it's just, it's a constant, constant, constant um, challenge of where we've placed our attention. My attention's divided, multitasking, on my smartphone, on a device. I mean, if you stand in an airport, you look at people and it's just, it's, it's, you don't see people stop and just, you know, quietly contemplating they're just everybody's consuming information all the time yes and, and i think people feel that that's a burden it's difficult for them and it, it makes it makes focusing difficult and focusing as a member of a team but as a leader it's a major challenge isn't it to get everyone focused yeah so one of the, the connection between brief and noise is that so a leader goes into a meeting and people aren't brief. And by brief, I mean they're not clear, they're not intentional, they're not concise, they're all over the place talking about issues and things like that. So the leader goes into a meeting and a person's not brief, it sounds like noise to the leader. So it's it's very static. It's like it's like it's not tuned into a radio station. You're exactly on the station, you're sort of near it. So you can somewhat hear what's being said, but you're not on the station. So 
um, that person is struggles. It takes a lot of energy to focus on something that doesn't really make sense. And, and that depletes a person's energy. And that same person is in that meeting and then they get a phone alert where there's emails and, and then they get a text message from somebody. So now I'm listening, but I'm doing three or four things at the same time. So the mind's divided. And that goes, carries on throughout the day. And that person can't lead anymore because their mind is in 50 different places and not where it needs to be. It's where it's everywhere, but it's nowhere. And I know that in the book, it's divided um, to into lots of different sections. We talked a little bit about the, you know, the how much noise there is. And I really thought that it was interesting when you talked about um, reducing the amount of noise, managing what's coming in. And, and I've, I've highlighted overcoming um, fear of missing out. We, 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 yeah, but pe people are afraid. They're afraid of, um, I might miss something. If you, you, when you're constant sources of information, you're scrolling pages and pages of web pages and sites and social media, there's this thing in the brain, it's almost like gambling, where you're, you're playing a slot machine and you, you just, one more try, I might win. One more try, I might win. I'm, I'm afraid that if I don't do it one more time, I, I might miss the big payout. And it tricks the brain in the we're afraid. So we continue to do this. It releases dopamine and we be, it becomes an addictive cycle, really. So one of the things that I've, I've come to the conclusion is, all right, who's, is technology working for me or am I working for it? So who's in charge here? Um, in, in a day, we did research at the Brief Lab and in 70% of a survey that we fielded, people, the first thing they do in the day and the last thing they do in the day is check their phone. So it's the, it's the first thought of the day and the last thought of the day. And everything in between becomes consuming information. So what I'm really proposing to people is this isn't, it's not healthy. It, sh, we, it didn't used to be this way. It's now this way in the past decade or so. It's changed dramatically. And we need to start doing things to manage it. It's not going to go away. I'm not, I'm not against technology and I'm certainly not against information. I, I love it, but we need to manage it. It's, it's like food. You don't, I, I like food, I, but we don't eat it all day. It's not, I mean, I have, I, have, I have meals that are set times. Information needs to be treated the same way where there's a sense of like, no, I'm, I'm managing this. It's not, in, it's not in control of my life. And I think that shift for people lowers the volume. And do you think that there's um, a variation between different age groups and gender? People would like to say this is a millennial thing or Gen X. It, I, and I, and I, my personal opinion, this is just unique in my opinion. I, I don't really put a lot of belief in it. I, I, I think that um, society gives these labels to people and they're all, and I get the fact that they're different. But when it comes to this, the brain's the brain and the brain gets addicted. So a really quick story in this regard. So I, I, I live in North Carolina in the United States. And I have, I teach courses to military leaders. So I had a group of um, soldiers, Marines actually, and, and we were at a break and they were probably late twenties, early thirties. And we were talking about noise and the new book. And one of, one of the students said to me, you know, 10 years ago, my father was really, really angry with me because he kept on saying, you're on your phone all the time. You're on the phone all the time. You're on the phone. So he said, 10 years later, my father's on the phone more than I am. <laughs> Okay. That so that's really a 30 year difference. Okay. So that's 30 year difference. So if you look at, if you look at age groups, those things like this is like, it, and I get, I, I, I talk to people like parenting and things and I and parents like, what do I do with my kids? And I'm like, you're not going to like what I'm going to tell you. And the and parents look at me like, what do you, what do you mean? And I said, well, you're blaming your kids, but why didn't you set a better example? Yes. They see you and you come home from work and you're on your phone all the time. Now, you have justification because you're afraid of missing out an email, your boss is gonna send you a note, you get an alert from the bank, et cetera, et cetera. But they look at it and you're like, they're not, but you're not paying attention to me. So yeah. you've lost all moral credibility because you're not leading by example. So in the same conversation with this soldier, another soldier chimes in, about the same age, about 30 years old. And he said he had driven all the way to New York City, it was about a five or six hour drive and to meet with some, some stu university students that, that they were like a re it was like a reunion he says i drove there and everybody was on their phone all weekend long and he goes i was oh no curious he says i if i'd known that i would have stayed home 
He says, I drove 12 hours yeah. to watch my, 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 my uh, friends sit on their phones all weekend long. He says, I was furious. That's an issue. It's, a, it's an issue. It's an issue. And people need ways to manage it. Because clearly right now, they just sort of given up the decision. And when my phone runs my life, information runs my life, noise runs my life. And that was really a big inspiration for me to write the book is to put people back in an encouraging place, practical place to, to say, okay, enough is enough. Like I can, I need to do things here. So if you had, if you were leading a meeting, for example, and you've got everybody messing around with their phones and beeping and somebody talks and then somebody get, rushes off and starts a phone. What would you do to manage that from the word go? Think of it like, if, 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 think of it like um, instead of a meeting, think of a dinner party. You invite, invite people to your home, you're having dinner. You want them to be present for the dinner. They're having a conversation yeah. together, but everybody, so a meeting is like that. I mean, a, a good meeting should be like mm -hmm. that. It's a good conversation, a good discussion, some decisions are made. So if you, you have to set some rules. Mm -hmm. One of the rules is, do you have an agenda for the meeting? Yeah. But the people coming to the meeting, do they know what, what are we talking about? Have they prepared for the meeting? Do they know why they're talking about it? What are the topics? What are we hoping to accomplish? Do they have a sense of how long it is? Who's there? most people just show up to a meeting and they have no idea. Yes. That would be like showing up to somebody's home and not knowing who lives there. What are we having? Like it's people don't do that. So that's the first thing. Another thing is tell people, you know, no phones, check your phone one last time. Even I've seen some companies do this with laptops is close your laptops. We're going to be present because people are taking notes, but they're not listening. Yeah. Take give people a chance to take notes at the end, maybe just have a pad of paper and then they can put notes. But I think being stuck in your computer, it's very tempting in the middle of the meeting. Okay, I'm bored. I'm going to check something else and nobody knows. Yeah. So yeah. regular technology, and those are just basic, basic rules. You can do that at the dinner table too. I, you know, no phones at the dinner table. When we got to dinner together, no phones. And you could say there are restaurants now that are starting to put devices near the booths and things for people to put their phones away. I mean, you know, it's really interesting because I think that it is about setting rules, setting mm -hmm. boundaries of the expectation of how people are going to behave in different business conversations. Yeah, I mean, what's most valuable is being present. Yes. You know, when, you, when you think about the best meetings is people are giving you the best gift, which is their undivided attention. That's difficult to give, but it's incredibly valuable. At the end of the day, what, what I'm looking at with this whole thing of noise is attention is a depletable resource. So it's our most valuable resource. It, the, the person who wrote the foreword to the book Noise describes it as attention economics. Where am I investing my attention and what am I getting as a return on attention? Because if you look at attention like a flashlight, okay, I have batteries in a flashlight. I don't know if you call it in the UK, it's not a flashlight, it's a, 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 a torch. You're, 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 so you're, but you're using it during the day. You're depleting the battery. And then when you need it at night, it's not strong. Attention, if you spend attention on something which is useless or useful, it takes the same amount of attention. It doesn't, it doesn't, so you're, what you're doing is depleting focus over time. And where I, where I spend my attention, where I place it is my choice. Yes. There's nobody responsible for that other than me. So I can't blame technology. This, I think people have lost to this. They, they, like I gave up this choice. No, it's still where, what goes in your head and what you think about during the day is only yours to choose. Nobody's yeah. running that, but somehow I've given up, to, I've given that over to a software developer. Yes, absolutely. He's been many. No, I don't, I've not, I've not given that up to a software. That's, that's, this is what I think about during the day. My phone did, didn't change that. Steve Jobs didn't change that, you know, um, app, software, social media, apps didn't change that. I gave that, per, I gave that up. Yeah. Get it back. Take it back. Yeah. What I think about is my responsibility. I call it attention management or awareness management. And that's one of the sections of the book. How do I manage my focus, my, my awareness, my attention is my responsibility. It's nobody else's. And so that's how the book is organized. It's an AM, FM, sort of using yeah. a radio metaphor. But awareness management is where do I, how do I manage my awareness? 
And then FM is how do I help other people? It's called focus management, help other people around me focus. So just a quick example, in awareness management, I have to say no to things, set boundaries, like you just said. Hmm. In focus management, I need to like run a meeting better. So I need to produce yeah. an agenda. Yeah. So do you see how those two things are like, all right, I'm going to say no to checking my phone in the meeting and I'm going to produce an agenda for the people that are in the meeting so that I can help them focus. By doing that, what we do is we lower the noise and we help ensure clarity or more clarity. And that for people is different. It's very encouraging. It's like, it's like I hear all the static and all of a sudden the static goes down and we can actually make that effect, which is pretty, which is powerful for people. Now, I, I think it's, I find it interesting when I'm in presentations or public speaking and there are, everybody's got their phones and they're taking photos and they're tweeting and things like that. And I remember as a speaker, I was quite taken aback by that at first. I thought, Oh gosh. Um, but the argument would be, and certainly for event planners, they love that because there are photos going up on social media and there's a hashtag and, and now the software that you can get that where people can interact and there can be polls or they can ask questions. What's your view on that? Some of it's, some of it's wonderful. Some of it's wonderful. What, what it really, what it's like is when you talk about social media, what social media is at its essence is that it's a, it's a new type of media. So what you have are really embedded reporters in a room that are, that are reacting live to, um, to the content. That's wonderful. What's not wonderful is people that are doing it just because. Yeah. So, you know, think about taking photos. If I'm going to take a photo and post it because I'm at an event and this is relevant and I want my network to hear and understand and link to that. And it's, and it's important. I'm like a reporter for them. I'm reporting the news. I'm generating media that's relevant. But then you get other people that are just generating it because they are doing it for themselves. I want to generate a following. It's, it's very, it can be very, in the extreme, extremely relevant or very narcissistic yes. at the same, in the same room. So my, one of the terms that I just, I really helps me is how is this relevant to people other than me producing it? If it's just relevant for me, then it may be noise for somebody else. And that's what I think a lot of social media becomes. If it's relevant for them, it's not noisy, it's relevant. I'm just some speaker. I was into the room. They shared it with me. Now I'm part of that. I can, I've seen that. And that's, that's now I'm connected to the news or, you know, what's up, up, up to date. So I think it could be both in the same room. Interesting, isn't it? Now, when I um, when I interview people, as you know, I always ask them for three top tips for effective communication. Now, obviously, with noise, they are going to be related to um, gaining clarity and getting rid of all of that noise, listening, everything. So I'd love to hear what your three tips are. OK, so there's. There's three things to, to do here. The first is it's very powerful and very simple. So I, I, I describe this as an old school answer to a new world problem. Say no. Yeah. Say no. So there's, there's a strength in, in that word that a person can say, and no does not mean never. No, because no can sound to the brain like, you mean I'm never going to do this? Say no, not now. Mm. Okay, no, not like if I'm in a meeting, and my impulse is to check my email. No, not now. It's not time for email right now. That for me is noise right now. In an hour, it's not noise. It's it's my job. But in a conversation, so no. One, the first is no, no, not now. The second thing is setting what is the most important thing for me today. I think it's not the things that I need to do today, but people have different roles. Generally speaking, people have between four and 10 roles in their lives, friend, spouse, coworker, volunteer, it's brother, sister, et cetera. If you look at your, like, think of them like hats. Yeah. So what I, what I, what I, what I do is there's a sentence, which is setting the most important thing, right? Taking, I call it like taking aim at the most important thing is in my role as brother. I'll use, cause I've got siblings. In my role as brother, the most important thing for me today is to do what? What's the most important thing? Not the things that I need to do, the most important thing. 
And what that does is it focuses people's attention in a day on in different roles, maybe three or four roles in a day, I'm doing the most important thing. Well, when I know what that is, then I'm saying yes to that, and it's easier to say no things that are that might stop me from doing that. So for example, today, as an author, this conversation is on my list is the most important thing I'm doing today. I need to be fully present for this conversation because I'm looking forward to it. We talked before. I have a lot of things to do, but when I have my focus on that, and then I change my role and I'm going to talk to my son. So that is like focus on what is in a role, what is the most important thing for me today? And usually that's three, three or four, things. three or four roles, three or four things. That's the second thing. So take aim at the most important. Always do the most important things because at the end of the day, because we, we live, we, we wake up, we live our day and then we go to sleep. In that day, if you go to sleep at the end of the night, doing, if you having done the most important thing, then your life is less noisy. Yeah. Yes. You ever, and, and what this, what this, what this averts is, and this happens to me a lot, happens to a lot of people, is your life becomes a blur. They look back and you're like, wow, a week went by and I don't even know what happened. <laughs> it's because they're doing everything, but they're not focusing on the most important thing. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's the second, that's a, I, I mean, I, these aren't in any particular order, but the third, th the third thing, and actually I would put this at the top, it's, it's, it's the last on the list, but it's actually the most important, is quiet time. But not quiet time like I'll do it when I can. This is different. We live in a very, very, there's a lot of things competing for my attention, for our attention. I absolutely need every day time in the morning and time in the evening that's scheduled, set, and non-negotiable. And if that's 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes in the evening, or if it's 15 minutes or it's five or 30, whatever the amount of time is, it's not what I feel, it's what I need. And I give myself quiet time. And in that quiet, we have to, there's a lot of ways to manage that quiet time. In the beginning, it's, it's very noisy. It's just me, my thoughts, no technology, quiet. I can go for a walk. I can sit in my house, in my car. There, I can do it. But it's, I, I'm, I show up like an appointment and it's just me. In the beginning, it is incredible how noisy it is. Because my brain's everywhere. It's like, uh, we need our brain is like an engine. It's a very high powered engine. We need to bring it down. We need to bring it down. And a part of that quiet time is sleep. Super important. The brain needs to sleep. So going to bed at a time, waking up at a time, having enough sleep. We need to, there's research, so much research on the importance of rest. People, if, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're not resting, and so one of the things that I suggest, and this is just, it's worked for me, and, and, I'm, and I'm guilty of this. It's so funny because when I talk to my siblings and I'm writing this book, I, I am not like, I have figured this problem out and I don't, have, I don't struggle with this anymore. I struggle with just as much as everybody else. Like I, I felt a little bit like when I was writing it, like I was unqualified because I have not mastered this in any way. Um, my siblings would tell me like, well, you do this. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> I'm writing it a lot in, in great part for myself. So one of the things I started doing, which has helped me a lot, is I call it the seven to seven rule. So I generally speaking, and I'm not really neurotic about this, but I generally speaking, I don't check technology or anything in, in, before 7 a.m. I, I generally wake up at 5.30, so 7 a.m. and then seven after 7 p.m. And these are general guidelines. Last night, I checked it at nine. But what people do is if you check it, if you're checking your phone first thing, if, if it's your first thought and your last thought, it affects your sleep. Yes. It creates anxiety. So checking your email at work or social media or looking at a newsfeed right before you go to sleep is not good for sleep. So creating boundaries where maybe an hour or two before you just create some quiet is a wonderful way. So quiet is, and what it does is it does lower the volume and it makes people less anxious and worried about stuff. Honestly, it's not important. It's not important. People spend a lot of time worrying about, I'm going to use this and I'm not doing this to, to diminish in any way how scary it is the coronavirus right so talking about right now it's going on in china spreading right oh gosh we it, it's everybody is so anxious they're in so the anxious right right I, I i believe okay so i believe that's of course for the people that are suffering that's terrible if you're quarantined on a ship or you're in in italy and all these things that are happening right now right? and in lord only knows how if it's going to get worse but in the moment right now i can't worry about that no I can't do anything about it. So for me, reading, 
the B and I it's so funny because I read the Wall Street Journal, the BBC. So I'm reading so get the oh, Wall Street. And, I, and I'm reading this and I'm like, all right, I feel my anxiety. I'm starting getting worried about it. And I'm like, stop. Hmm. I this is this right now is noise for me. I can't, it's not relevant for me right now. I'm worrying about something that I can't control. It's outside of my my control. When I, when it's time to worry about it, I'll worry about it. But if it's not, I'm not gonna worry about it. I think consuming information if it creates anxiety makes people nervous you gotta moderate it and giving yourself quiet time is absolutely critical non-negotiable not like i'll do it when i have time that for me has changed how i see life i'm not nearly as worried or preoccupied about things that used to drive me crazy much more much more centered i mean i'm i'm, I'm certainly not going to say like i've solved the problem because it's it's not like that but it's a daily practice that really has helped me tremendously it, it's so interesting because um, we do get sucked into news and social media and our phones. It can do so many things now. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm absolutely certain that what is in this book is going to help leaders, is going to help entrepreneurs and executives who want to, um, want to be emerging leaders to be more present and to perform better. If, if, if you look at people in those positions that you just mentioned, all those positions, what they all share is pressure. Yes. You're, there's expectations, mm -hmm. there's pressure, there's responsibility. None of that is, comes easy. And what, we're, what I'm talking about is, is, is decreasing the burden. Consuming noise adds to the pressure because my brain works faster it goes four times faster than I can read or hear, right? We talk about in the book, the elusive 600 of the brain's ability to process information four times faster than, than a person can speak or hear or read. Well, in that moment, if I'm consuming noise all day, what I'm doing is I'm becoming very agitated, very, very splintered. My brain is in a million different places and I can't be decisive. I can't be centered and I am becoming ineffective as a leader. And it's not just as a leader, as a person. So who you are at work is who you are at home. We don't, we can't just walk out and become a different role. Those things, the, the, those things are connected to each other. And what I'm really encouraged when I've, I've talked to some people about the book already is giving people a practical way to manage this so that they can focus on the most important things in their lives, which is starting a business and all these things that you just mentioned and not feel so much pressure. Yes, yeah, because stress and pressure are major factors for executives. Major, and I think when I go back to quiet, I think one of the things that people, when you're leading, there's, there's just moments to be intentional, just to think, and, and that habit in the beginning is hard. But it, this whole thing is probably not a surprise as we're having this conversation, is in the connectivity brief is to be more intentional. Yes. Clear thinking, clear thinking leads to clear communicating. And, and together, we become an intentional communicator. Well, if you look at that, it's a fancy word. I'm an intentional communicator. I say things because I need to say them. Yes. I know what's important. I don't treat words lightly. I don't treat thoughts lightly or people lightly. And the quiet is a moment for a person to really have, okay, what, what, what is, what is, you know, what, what am I saying? Um, why does this matter to a person? Why does it matter to me? I'll give you a, like an example that just happened recently about a conversation. I was talking to um, a female leader actually, and she was talking to me about how she was voicing a frustration with, with, with her boss. So she was an executive talking to a higher level executive, but something that was really frustrating her. And she finally got up the nerve and she went into his office and she says, I need to talk to you. I'm really frustrated about this thing. And what she talked about, you can be frustrated about a million things, but she was frustrated about the fact that she's been there high performer and she's been passed over for a number of promotions. Really, she says, I've had it. I'm going to talk to him, have this voices, this frustration. And in a couple of things happened that were really noteworthy. She, number one is it was good that she did that because she needed to. But she never took time and quiet to really think more about why was this so frustrating to her. So she, he asked her, so why is, why is this bother you so much? She didn't have an answer. He asked her, so what do you think I should do about it? He, she didn't have an answer. 
And then she left flustered. She said, I had my moment, which is good. She acted, her instinct was right to voice the frustration, but she didn't in that quiet time that she didn't give herself, she didn't have time to think, okay, I am frustrated, but why am I frustrated? And if, and if, and if he hears my frustration, he wants to help me. How, how is he? She wasn't ready for that because she didn't give herself the time. We need to give ourselves the time. Yeah. And that has to be scheduled. And people don't schedule. It's amazing. And the most effective leaders do. <laughs> Now, you know, something that's that's hitting me firm in the, fray, in the face is the idea of quiet. I don't know if you're an introvert or an extrovert. I suspect you're... I'm, a, I'm what they would call an ambivert. So I'm, I'm a bit of both. And it's hard to say because over the years I've, I've become more extroverted because of my what I do for a living. But I'm, my instinct is introvert. So I'm a, I'm a bit of both. Yeah. I think the same thing has happened with me. I, I am introverted, but I've become less introverted. I can play at being extrovert. But a lot of these things about having quiet and being uh, being slightly more reflective are more introvert instincts, aren't they? Yes, they, they are. There, there's a woman named Susan uh, Cain wrote a book called Quiet, which... Yes. It's a, it's a, it's a remarkable book, and, and, and you know, obviously, I would highly recommend your listeners you know read the book. But there's also a PDF summary of it, which gives the essence of the book. Um, but the point of the book is that introverts have an advantage because their instinct is to quiet in reflection and thinking before they speak. So one one of the things that we were talking about earlier before the before our interview started was um, how introverts you know can have the advantage if you teach them some basic skills of communicating, and when they speak it's really powerful because they don't, their instinct isn't to talk very much, but when they actually say something, it's like, wow, this is, this is great. Yeah, but you're right. The instinct to quiet is, is an introverted thing. So therefore my next question from this is if you have some extrovert executives that you're training, (coughs) how would you empower them to be able to take that step? And I mean, I think that the thing with quiet is that, we need it. We need it. It's not a yeah. nice to have. It's a need to have. So I think the first thing for a busy executive as an extrovert, his instinct is to rush forward, speak first, think second, make things happen. They have like in the military, that's a term that they use a bias toward action. <laughs> it's like we oh, just do, we have a bias to action. We have a bias to do is you need to stop and think first. What is your intention? What is your intention? How are you letting your brain slow down at the end of the day? How do you let it prepare at the beginning of the day? Being more intentional. And if a person's like, well, I don't like it, I, 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 I would say two things. One is you need it. And more importantly, the people that you're leading need it. Yes. Because when you don't do it, you're creating noise for them. And they have to act on that noise. And it's confusing to them. So they have to, you're creating rework. You're creating frustration, confusion. I mean, you're, there's all second, third order effect in that. So you need it as a leader and your people need it. So stop making excuses that I'm too busy to have quiet. Schedule it. You, nobody says I'm too busy to brush my teeth and eat. <laughs> in the same thing, in our age now, in the information age of, of, of information overload, it's an absolute must-have, non-negotiable. Quiet in the morning, in the evening, non-negotiable. Brilliant. For as hard as it might be every day every day and you can do different things in that i I would suggest this is just might help your listeners just in ways okay what am i going to do when i'm in quiet Mm -hmm. i created this metaphor these cards i've actually a set of cards that we're going to soon put on our website thebrieflab.com but in the in the cards when i come to quiet i don't know what to do with it so i created things to do um plan uh think um decide um complain (laughs) read Listen, nothing, um, pray, um, 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 you know, uh, reflect, remember. So I can go into that moment of quiet. So how do I want to spend this time? Well, I'm going to spend five minutes just thinking, thinking like gratitude. Gratitude is a wonderful way of lowering noise. Yes. If a person's got anxiety and they're worrying about like, is the coronavirus going to wipe me out? The, you know, am I going to die tomorrow? And it could be the new version of the bubonic plate all these things stop and say for five minutes, what I'm going to do is write a list of everything I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for shoes. I'm thankful for the fact that I can watch, you know, this program until I'm, I'm, and you can write a list in five minutes. Guess what happens? The noise goes down. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. I mean, and, 
Yeah, it, yeah. So, so it's it's using the time in 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 a variety of different ways, not just sitting staring at the wall. Yes. Yeah. Because that would, I right. think would would cause anxiety to a lot of people. Yeah, it, 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 it's very, it's actually very noisy for people. They, they, the quiet time can be very useful. I use it to decide. I use it to think. I use it to read. I use it to plan. Um, it, all, all these different things, but I, I, I choose them, and and it becomes very, it becomes very, uh, um, the time is very uh, um, beneficial for me. Brilliant. So before we go, um, how can people find out more about your book, Noise? There's a website that we created called NoiseTheBook.com, and there's links there to, for tools. We have like a survival guide. There's two free chapters of the book. Um, there's information that they can find there. And what I want people to know, though, after this is when I wrote this, and because because your expertise is in communication, is that there is a connection between managing noise and clear communicating. Yes. Because when you manage noise, you become a clearer thinker. Things are clearer to you. People's brains are filled with all these thoughts. And when it comes time to communicating, if you, it, it's very difficult to be consistent, clear, concise, because you have all of these things that I need to say. So when you do one, if you manage the noise, it helps you become a clear communicator. And the opposite is also true. When a person's not clear, they create noise for people. And just think that these things work together. It's not, a, it's not another, another thing in our life. They, they work together. And it, 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 th th these are very, th very practical things. Like what I talked about, like, say no. Yes. I can say no, not now. I can set, okay, here are the three most important things for me to do today, given my three different roles. I can take quiet. Those are things that anybody can do, but we have to decide to do them. Yes. And, and, the, and, the, and the, the, the risk is if I don't do them, noise is managing my life. If I yes. do them, I am managing it. And you can't make the volume go, 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 go away completely, but you can lower it. And I think when the people start to lower it, what they hear is amazing. What okay. they hear is amazing. What you're missing, what you're missing is everything. You're missing the life that you're in. You're missing what's actually being said in the meeting, the issue that the person has, the person that you're talking to across the table. I mean, you're missing everything. The no noise is all consuming. If you lower it, you can actually hear wonderful things. And that's, and that was a really motivating thing for me to write the book. Absolutely brilliant. I will put that link in the notes for people to, um, to download and purchase the book. I know that it's also available in audible as well as a hard copy. That's correct. Because one or two of my clients have downloaded the audible book already. Wonderful. So thank you very, very much, Joe. It has been an absolute pleasure and an honor again. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and expertise. Thanks so much for having me again. It's great to talk to you. Thank you very much. You have been listening to the Superstar Communicator podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and review the podcast on iTunes and on apps. Please contact us if you want to discuss any topic, could suggest a topic for us to include, or a guest who could come onto the podcast. Go to superstarcommunicator.com.